We are live. All right, thank you. So we're back and, and Jen, thanks for, for being here with us. We have S24 on the schedule to get a first look. Um, and why don't you walk us through the bill? It's the, the flavored uh, products bill that we passed last year out of committee and then it went, um, it went to finance and then it sort of ended there uh, with COVID and the committee never really had an opportunity to fully um, present the bill to the Senate. So we'll look at it again. Okay, do you want me to put the language up on the screen? Yes, please. Okay, great. Uh, so for the record, Jennifer Carby, Legislative Council, uh, and I will put this up. All right, can you now see my screen? Great. So this is S24, as um, the chair said, this was a bill that was uh, worked on in this committee last year. It was S288 from the prior biennium. Um, and the bill as introduced is as it left this committee last year. So this committee had made some changes and those are reflected in here. It's not the same as what was introduced last year. So it starts out with uh, a number of findings, and I don't know if you want me to go through those or just note that they're here for another time. Um, uh, why, don't, why don't we skip them for now or, and then we'll come back to them. Uh, they, are, they are pretty important um, as an introduction, but let's skip them for now. Okay. Um, so section two then amends the chapter on tobacco products. Um, it makes some changes in definitions it, uh, it tries to make some, create some consistency between definitions in the tobacco taxes chapter in Title 32 and in, um, in this chapter. So that's this definition that you're seeing under tobacco products. Tobacco substitute, uh, it expands the definition of tobacco substitute to capture some emerging products. Um, so it talks about, for example, about components, parts, and accessories of electronic or battery powered devices. Um, also talks about inhalation or other absorption of aerosol, vapor, or other emission. And these are all, when we talk about tobacco substitute, it's, it's the statutory term we use for what people often call electronic cigarettes um, or vaping devices, things like that. These are things that have not been approved by the FDA for tobacco cessation or other medical purposes. So if it's a tobacco cessation device, it's not a tobacco substitute under our definition. And then it adds a definition of e-liquid. This is the substance, solution substance or other material used in or with a tobacco substitute that is heated or otherwise acted upon to produce an aerosol, vapor, or other emission to be inhaled or otherwise absorbed by the user, regardless of whether it contains nicotine. So this is a new definition, but, but a term we've been kind of describing in various ways. So one of the things this bill is doing is creating some consistency around the use of this term. Um, it adds this e-liquid terminology throughout the statute. So you'll see in this next section about getting a license, it specifically requires someone to have a, a tobacco license from the Division of Liquor Control um, in order to engage in the retail sale of e-liquids as is required already for these other items. So a lot of this, a lot of the changes are just adding e-liquids to the various existing provisions, or in this case, um, replacing substances containing nicotine or otherwise intended for use with a tobacco substitute with our new term e-liquids. A little bit cleaner and easier to use. So again, same changes in this section. It's really amending the whole, uh, whole chapter on tobacco products, creating some consistency in various places. So for example, it dis the display of tobacco products, this would also add tobacco substitutes and e-liquids. Um, this is an exemption for what has to be, um, where things can be displayed. Uh, if it's in, a, in an establishment where no one under 21 is permitted to enter. Again, adding e-liquids. Um, then this piece here in section um, 1005 eliminates the ban on and penalty for possession 
of cigarettes, e-cigarettes, and tobacco paraphernalia by people who are under 21 years of age. So it keeps the ban on, on uh, and penalty for purchasing, attempting to purchase and using false identification to purchase or attempt to purchase these products for e-liquids, um, but it gets rid of the, the ban and penalty for possession. That's that piece Then we have again, adding e-liquids. Then somewhere in here we get to, this is the sort of correction of the name, this, this um, tobacco evaluation. And a review board became part of one, one board that was folded into the Substance Misuse Prevention Oversight and Advisory Council. Um, added some provisions to the contraband and seizure statute um, to reflect the various items that are not allowed to be sold, offered, or in some cases possessed. Um, so this is adding it to adding the tobacco substitutes, e-liquids, and tobacco paraphernalia, and the appropriate cross-references for those. Then again, changing a definition or changing a term to use this shorter e-liquids term that we have defined in full um, and adding tobacco substitutes, e-liquids and, and tobacco paraphernalia to um, part of the, um, to the description of, of, of what somebody would be uh, assessed a, a penalty for, for violating if they made a shipment in violation of the law. Um, again, here using the term e-liquids uh, e containing nicotine instead of liquid nicotine. And then finally we get to section, a new section here, section 7 BSA 1013. Um, and this is flavored tobacco products, flavored tobacco substitutes and flavored e-liquids prohibited. We start out with a definition here of characterizing flavor. It means a taste or aroma other than that of tobacco imparted either prior to or during consumption of a tobacco product or tobacco substitute or component part or byproduct of a tobacco product or tobacco substitute. It includes tastes or aromas relating to any fruit, chocolate, vanilla, honey, maple, candy, cocoa, dessert, alcoholic beverage, mint, menthol, wintergreen, herb, or spice, or other food or drink, or to any conceptual flavor that imparts a taste or aroma that is distinguishable from tobacco flavor, but may not relate to any particular known flavor. I'll just pause here for a moment. A lot of the, the terms in this section um, came from some rules and emergency rules that were adopted in other jurisdictions um, a couple of years ago when there was a lot of concern about, in particular, youth using flavored vaping products. Um, and so this was largely a list of their tastes or aromas, although I added maple because we're Vermont and it seemed wrong to have a list of flavors that did not include maple. Um, and this idea of a conceptual flavor, you'll hear about things like um, unicorn puke and, uh, and things like that that are not any actual um, known flavor, but are, uh, based on the descriptions, not tobacco flavored either. So a um, little background there. Sandra Lyons. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, in all of that description, last year, this thing fell on its sword on menthol. Does this ban menthol cigarettes? Yes, it does. Okay. That's why it didn't come off the wall in finance last year. That was the that, that, that will be uh, a significant part of our consideration and yeah. testimony. Yeah, so one of the characterizing flavors here is menthol. Um, and then we get to flavored e liquid. Is any e liquid with a characterizing flavor? It is presumed to be flavored if uh, a licensee, manufacturer, or their agent or employee has made a statement or claim directed to consumers or the public, whether expressed or implied that the product has a distinguishable taste or aroma other than that of tobacco. Flavored tobacco product means any tobacco product with a characterizing flavor. Um, again, it's presumed to be flavored if there is any uh, statement or claim expressed or implied that it has a distinguishable taste or aroma other than that of tobacco. 
So all of these items are pulling in this characterizing flavor definition, which includes menthol. Uh, and then flavored tobacco substitute, again, any tobacco substitute with a characterizing flavor and that same language about uh, the presumption for flavors. And then a tobacco retailer is um, anyone who owns, operates, or manages the retail establishment with a tobacco license from the Division of Liquor Control. So then this, this ban uh, says no person shall engage in the retail sale of any flavored tobacco product, flavored e-liquid, or flavored tobacco substitute. If a tobacco retailer or their agent or employee violates this section, the retailer, so not the employee or agent, but the retailer is subject to a civil penalty of not more than $100 for a first offense and not more than $500 for a second offense. This is for the same as would it be for uh, as same as the existing penalties for sales to a minor. And an action under this section will be brought in the same manner as for a traffic violation. So that means uh, in the at the Judicial Bureau uh, within 24 hours of the occurrence of the alleged violation. Section three then gives the Judicial Bureau jurisdiction over violations of the ban on the sale of flavored products. Um, it also makes a conforming change uh, to reflect that the possession would not be subject of, by minors is not subject to penalty, but the purchase is. Um, of tobacco products generally. And then section four is a conforming change adding e-liquids to an exception in the default penalty provisions for all of title seven. Section 16, uh, sorry, say, section five is in title 16. It adds uh, e-liquids to a ban on the use of tobacco products and e-cigarettes on public school grounds. Section six makes conforming changes to the Substance Misuse Prevention Oversight and Advisory Council. Um, so again, using the e-liquids term instead of the longer description. Um, section seven makes some clarifying changes to the definition of other tobacco products for purposes of the tax on e-cigarettes. Um, there were some inconsistencies in that language and then it also pulls in again, this new e-liquids definition and then section eight directs the attorney general's office to report by December to um, this committee and to the economic development committee and to uh, various committees in the house about whether and to what extent Vermont can legally restrict advertising and regulate the content of labels for electronic cigarettes and other vaping related products in this state. Now there has been a fair amount of interest in what the state uh, can do and it seemed like a good idea to get you some, some information um, from those who would be in a position to defend the law if you were to enact one. And it would take effect on September 1st, which was the same, uh, September was when you also had the change in the, uh, in the use of tobacco by minors statute, I think uh, to give some time for enforcement to be ready, but also have it up and, and running approximately the time that the kids start back in school for the fall. Um, thank you, Jen. Um, you know, I guess as the lead sponsor on the bill, I would like to say a few words um, of introduction to the bill and why I feel it's important. And you can look at the findings that are there in the bill. And I think the first finding is particularly compelling that we spend, um, Vermont spends over um, $348 million annually to treat tobacco related illnesses. And that's 87.2 million in Medicaid dollars. So that's a lot of money. Um, that's a, the long-term goal for reducing those chronic illnesses is something that we sometimes cannot see because we're, we keep our eyes on the short-term revenue prize. And so we'll have a, uh, we'll have a fiscal note regarding um, this. But, but much more compelling to me is the data that's coming out about the increase of youth utilization for um, cigarettes and particular menthol cigarettes. So if you look at some of the, some of the information, um, you find that uh, 
in 20, uh, in 2017, between 2017 and 2019, there was a 20% increase in the use of menthol cigarettes. Um, that was by over, over 20% by kids. Uh, high school students who smoke use menthol cigarettes. 54.5% of Vermont high school students who smoke use menthol cigarettes. That engages them not just in the use of the cigarette, but in an addiction that may carry on for time over time. 48.4% uh, of middle school students use menthol cigarettes. Those who smoke use menthol cigarettes. So the flavors have become extremely attractive and we're gonna hear testimony ne next week that I think will help us understand the inequity that is out there, not just in the advertising, but then in the result of the use of tobacco and flavored products generally. So we know that African-Americans uh, and LGBTQ are much more likely to use flavored e-cigarettes and tobacco, including menthol. We'll get some data on that. But it, the, the attractive nature of advertising has resulted not just in inequity of use, but now in equity of health. And so we see that some of our minority populations are being greatly affected by um, inhalation, by smoke, by nicotine addiction. Uh, so we'll hear testimony about that. And I find it extremely compelling. The uh, vulnerability to diseases cannot be understated for our um, African-American and our black population, particularly during COVID. And we have seen recent um, articles, and I, I don't know whether I put them on the web page or not, but we'll get some, an article or two out on the effect of um, the relationship between smoking and COVID. So there is a, there is a great deal for us to uh, put our heads into in terms of the significant public health issues related to the use of flavored e-cigarettes and flavored tobacco, including menthol. I know there are some misconceptions about menthol and we'll try to sort those out. I, I call it the menthol mask. Uh, the menthol mask is that it doesn't feel bad when you inhale it, but you're still getting damage to the trachea, the bronchi and the lungs. Uh, so we'll get testimony about whether or not menthol actually causes, uh, helps people to uh, quit. We've heard that, and yet we know that nine in 10 uh, black adults uh, utilize menthol cigarettes, and that perpetuates in the, that cohort. So there's a lot of data out there, a lot of information, and I think one of the things this bill does for me is it highlights um, some of the public health issues around inequality and about the inequities that we are seeing with our um, our BIPOC and LGBTQ populations. So uh, I will say no more, but I do encourage you to read through the findings. We may find that we want to add, subtract, um, or modify some of those to be, um, to be representative of the current, um, current information as we hear testimony. So Senator Terenzini has very patiently waited with his hand up. Uh, but as sp lead sponsor, I did want to introduce the bill and we'll probably, we will go through the bill again as we hear more from folks who testify uh, so that we can fully understand what, um, what Jen has presented today. So Senator Terenzini. Uh, thank you, Senator Lyons. Uh, thanks for the explanation. Gives me a better understanding of uh, the bill as this is my first time looking at it. Uh, just for my clarification, and I believe the question, but um, so menthol cigarettes and then flavored liquids or whatever you put in a, an e-cigarette, would chewing tobacco be a part of this, flavored chewing tobacco? Great question. I don't remember. Let me scroll down and look at the definitions. Yeah. It's another tobacco product. Right. I think, I think it is. I think it is a... Um, I'm just just 
And this is for adults, adults and, and children, children, right? Uh, right. I mean, purchase, purchase, and purchase would be banned for anyone under twenty-one, regardless of whether it's flavored or unflavored. That that's already the case. Um. So the definition of tobacco products um, in our statutes is cigarettes, little cigars, roll your own tobacco, snuff cigars, new smokeless tobacco, which I think is um, chewing tobacco, and any other product manufactured from, derived from, or containing tobacco that is intended for human consumption by smoking, by chewing, or in any other manner. So yes, okay. it would include. Thank you for the... Uh... Clarification, Jennifer. Sure. Other other questions uh, for Jen on the bill. Uh, Jen, I do have a question. I, I know that there's a a the purchase, use, and possession, uh, the pup <laughs> provisions. Um, so there was a bill. There's a bill introduced in economic development on that and I'm but is none is that in as you went through the bill I I apologize I was probably too glazed over my own bill but how much of the PUP is included in this bill if any uh a fair amount is uh I think I'd, I'd have to look at them side by side I don't remember which pieces there's certainly a lot of the sort of general cleanup provisions are in both, um, but there are some differences. I'd be happy to, to look at that and get back to you. Okay, yeah, that would be good. I, I wanna make sure that we're coordinated with whatever uh, comes out of economic development. Senator Hardy. I, I'm sorry, I didn't, what is PUP? I didn't catch what that was and coordinating with what? <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, so it's purchase, use, and possession. So currently there are um, on, on the books, Jen, maybe you could explain the, the fines that are on the books, the, the legality of purchase, use, and possession for underaged folks. Right, and I'm just, I'm pulling up the, the other bill so that okay. I can. Um, so one of the things as we took, have taken testimony in the past and we uh actually i think it was senator cummings who originally brought up the idea that if uh, if an underage um uh african-american male is driving in his car smoking there that could be uh considered an opportunity by a uh, public safety to pull him over um so under the exist so under the existing law, um, there's a prohibition on anyone under 21 years of age possessing, purchasing, or attempting to purchase tobacco products, tobacco substitutes, or tobacco paraphernalia, unless they're an employee, um, you know, of a, of a retailer. There's also a specific ban on rep misrepresenting age to purchase or attempt to purchase these products, and then there is a $25. Um, civil penalty for someone who possessed, for a minor who possesses these items in violation of this prohibition. And then there's a larger penalty for someone who misrepresents their age by presenting false, uh, false identification. That's um, civil penalty of up to $50 or 10 hours of community service or both. So all of that would be uh, repealed in the bill that is in Senate Economic Development, it's S41. There are also a couple of other provisions in it that, that are related um, that would be modified as well. So the bill S24 that you're looking at would, would similarly eliminate the prohibition on possession by minors, but would uh, keep the penalty for purchase and attempting to purchase. Um, so one of them is, is getting rid of penalties on purchase, use and possession. The other, that's S41. The purchase piece still remains against the law in S24, but the 
use and possession. I mean, there isn't really a big distinction in, in there between use and possession. Um, so there isn't, so what, I guess what I'm saying is there isn't a specific, you can possess, but you can't use distinction somewhere, or you can use, but you can't possess. So you think of it as purchase, purchase and possession. Um, that's what the one in economic development gets rid of. Possession is what S24 would get rid of, but it would still penalize purchase. And, and I think that some of the uh, arguments that people had provided for wanting to get rid of the possession penalty uh, had to do with the, the addiction, addictive qualities of um, some of these items and, um, and concern about penalizing an addiction. Go ahead, Senator Cummings. Is that, but first, does that answer your question, Senator Hardy? Yeah, I think so. And this bill, our bill that we're looking at gets rid of the possession stuff too in, in most of the cases. And, and S41, the other bill, does a more comprehensive, it's beyond tobacco or is it just related to tobacco products? So they, right, so they are different. It is just related to tobacco, um, tobacco products. It doesn't get into the, the flavor ban. The flavor ban actually only um, is, for, is a ban on the retail sale. So there are some distinctions between the two of them that get hard to, to right. abstractly generalize. Um, but I can, I can, if it's helpful, I can put something together that compares them or, well, or they're whatever, probably whatever's moving useful. Moving targets at this point, right? Um, in terms of the committees are both, are, is that bill being actively worked on, um, Senator Lyons? Is, I, I don't know. Don't know? Oh, I don't okay. know at this point. Okay. I, I don't need to know this now. I just, you know, curious moving yeah, forward. No, it, I think it's important for us to understand there's another bill out there that could be in play, but we can focus just on what this bill does at this point. Senator Cummings. Okay. This bill would ban anything other than raw tobacco taste from possession use or from sale or just sale. Just yeah. sale. Just so retail you sale. Know, tobacco flavored tobacco in Vermont. And it's not illegal to possess other things. I believe last time we had testimony from a smoke shop owner who literally moved 50 yards over the border and opened a store in New Hampshire and closed his Vermont store because his customers can walk to New Hampshire. You can, so a teenager can go to New Hampshire, buy vapes, come back here, and there's no penalty for smoking them, right? Right. And, okay. and the bill is introduced, that's right. We know what, well, we can't get into Quebec anymore. Do we know what New York does? Not off the top of my head, but I can. That would be worth look. checking. Uh, we, know New we, we know Massachusetts has uh, passed this, the, the bill before us, the, the full ban. Senator Cummings, I don't know. Is everyone else hearing this strange? Yes. Um, yes. Your, <laughs> like Vader, your audio is really weird and it's. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, I don't have anything else on. I will shut it off. It sounds like there may be a problem with the microphone. Yeah. You sound like a little grizzly bear. Oh. <laughs> Well, I haven't changed anything. Well, we can we can understand what you're saying. It's just that there's a little growl that comes through. <laughs> um, okay, I'll I haven't changed anything. I'll shut it back off. Well, don't. I mean, uh, do you have anything else to that you wanted to add or, or ask at this point? No. Nope. All right. Any any other any questions about this? So so Jen, just to clarify, one more time for for those of us who are 
really have the a need to understand thoroughly. The can you explain to us um, sort of the overarching provisions of the bill? So the bill bans what, allows for the for the purchase of what, for the use of what, for the possession of what. So the, I think those those are kind of the bottom line areas for the bill. So the bill bans the retail sale, but not the possession of flavored cigarettes, e-cigarettes and e-liquids. So only tobacco flavored products would be allowed. This includes a ban on menthol cigarettes. Um, it does not prohibit, as I said, possession uh, of any of these items by anyone regardless of age because it eliminates the ban and penalty for possession by minors and by minors in this case the it is uh, under 21. So retail sale you could uh, people 21 and over could only purchase tobacco flavored products at retail sale um, but possession of anything it would be allowed. Anyone, was, although I should I should clarify that I mean the the retail sale piece also incorporates the um, the ban on internet direct sales so right, right. Um, so that would be included as well right but if as long as there's a state over the border you can go and purchase and then bring it back and use it mm -hmm. bring it back and uh, yes and use it so Senator Hooker and then Senator Terenzini. So this would also include all of those old time tobacco um, or pipe tobacco products like cherry tobacco and and the like, correct? I believe that's accurate based on the definition of um, tobacco products. Okay. Senator <clears throat> Terenzini. Thank you. Uh, are there any other states that um, currently outlaw um, these products that we know of? That's a really good question. The answer is yes. And um, it's not really outlaw, it's really just ban, but the outlaw is a, that's an interesting phrase. <laughs> it's, a, it's a synonym, it works. It's a synonym, yeah, it works, okay. So uh, I, know, I know Massachusetts does, and I know there, there, I think some other states have since passed that law, but we'll, uh, this is a question that we'll have to ask folks as they come in to testify. And I can so, certainly okay, look so into I, it as well. Yeah, I'm not a, I'm not a cigarette smoker, so I'm I don't I don't know. But if I was in Massachusetts and wanted to pick up a pack of smokes and they were menthols, I could I could not. You're saying essentially. Yes, that's right. Hmm. Interesting. And, and you couldn't get any flavors anywhere. Gotcha. Yeah. So and you know I had thought about having someone in from Massachusetts, and we may well do that as time goes on uh, to hear. What, what's happened there, um, you know, what effect it's had. Uh, the, um, we, have a, we have a full day of testimony scheduled for next Wednesday. And then after that, we'll, we'll be bringing other folks in uh, to get perspective. You're, Senator Lyons, you're trying to make it so I'm never welcome at a family reunion again. <laughs> no, I no, I'm not. No, I'm not. You you are working for the for the health and welfare of the people of the state. <laughs> that's that's our goal. I mean, the Constitution does provide for the public health and welfare. And this this is a, this. I know it's not easy. Any other questions, Senator Hooker? Just a comment that um, Massachusetts was the first state to do this, and then whoops. New York, New Jersey, Rhode Island, and California have also banned them. So. I have to look at that. I'm not, I think there may be some nuances or some of it was done by, uh, by regulation. Uh, yep, yeah, some by law. Um. So let me let me look into it and get back. Yeah. To why don't Why don't you sort that out? And we'll, when we when we bring you back on this one, um, 
we'll have we'll maybe look at what other states have done a little bit. Would, is that something you can provide, or should we reach out to someone else for that? Uh, I will do my best. I may reach out to um, to some of the advocates, or if they have information and want to provide it to me, that is also great. Okay. Um, Go ahead, Senator. Just um, how is my audio now? I'll You're still a little grizzly bear. Okay, I'll stop the the video. Does that help? No, no. Uh, it, we it, it's good when we can see you because then we can lip read. All right. Well, maybe I'll yeah, just I'll shut down my computer and restart. Um, I, I think if we're going to hear from other states, I'd like to know how successful they've been in cutting out or reducing smoking. Because I find it interesting, we just legalized cannabis on the argument that prohibition doesn't work. We are not prohibiting strawberry flavored vodka or Boone's Farm or any of the other youth focused alcohol. And I, I want to know before we do this, does it work? And see if some of those other states can tell us. So I guess that's a that's a that's a point that we may well we want to hear about. But remember something about our alcohol sales in this state; it's highly regulated. The cherry strawberry flavored vodka can only be purchased in certain places, and there's, um, you know, and we've had a lot of very um, a lot of focus on that similarly with cannabis so I'm not sure the analogy is going to be something that helps us but we'll certainly look at it the uh, the amount of money that we put into chronic conditions as a result of tobacco is significant and we want to try to uh, begin to get rid of that you know the 348 million dollars a year is just overwhelming for me but um, so good question. And have other states seen any, any decrease in those expenditures? It's probably too short a time really to get results, but I don't know. We'll, we'll find out. Senator Lyons? Yeah. So last year, this bill went through your health care committee and ended up in finance. Is that what I was understanding? Yes, and, and to be quite honest about it, uh, it ended up in finance and the discussion was focused on some um, information about um, menthol tobacco, as far as I know. Uh, but that's, you know, I think the issue and about money, I mean, finance is money. Mm -hmm. I don't know. What was uh, it? It stayed on the wall because there were several straw polls and support with the menthol ban, I believe there were three pro votes. Oh. It didn't have the support, so we didn't bring it out. These okay, were, that uh, helps. All right, so I think, yes, yeah, so, so uh, what I think is that it will be incumbent on whatever this committee decides to ensure that we have a very focused um, uh, argument for whatever we pass out. We never really had the opportunity to share the information that we learned in committee. So, oh, she's going to come back. I know that. All right, Senator Terenzini, go ahead. Uh, two quick questions. Uh, when it was voted out of health and welfare in the last biennium, was it a unanimous vote? Yes, it was. And uh, number two, um, will we hear testimony from say like the Vermont Grocers Association or one of those about their about the impacts to the financials of that industry? Yes, we will. Okay, we'll hear Thank from you. them. And we'll hear from them. We'll hear from the tobacco industry. We'll hear from a, a number of folks. Uh, next week is really focused on the health, health issues and um, the inequity uh, that we see as a result of uh, advertising from the industry. So we'll, we'll, but we will, we will look at um, all those, the other areas. I'm back. Is my audio any better? Oh, it's awesome. Yes. Okay. When in doubt, shut it down. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I won't say it, but you did sound a little bit like you had been smoking. Okay, no. <laughs> I have never smoked. My father would have disowned me if I looked at a cigarette. <laughs> I know. Isn't that amazing, huh? Times, times have changed. All right. Um, any other questions for Jen on uh, S24? Uh, and so I'm hearing, I'm hearing some of the interest in who we should hear from. So to the extent practicable, uh, we want to hear about other states and we'll try and get information from those other states, whether it's directly or through some compilation of information available from those states. Um, and then we're also, I do have um, the Vermont Grocers Association on my list. I do have the uh, tobacco industry on my list. And I would like also to hear from some youth who are very engaged in um, the area of youth tobacco prevention. So we'll hear from them. Um, and, and we also have some researchers, uh, advocates, and some national, uh, national figures who have been very much involved in the uh, issues around inequity uh, will be coming in. That, I mean, given the focus that we have in this state right now on equitable treatment um, for some of our, for the uh, BIPOC and LGBTQ, this, this, this bill to me really uh, represents an opportunity to uh, look at that issue in health and welfare. Oh. And so let me know if you have other ideas about who you wanna hear from um, and we'll, we'll try to get everyone scheduled in on a, 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 another day. We have one day full. We'll try and get another day full uh, so we can uh, fully understand the bill. And we'll have Nolan put together, um, or Graham Campbell, I guess, a fiscal note so we understand some of the fiscal consequences of what we send out and probably over somewhere if it goes to finance. Senator Hardy. Thank you. I was going to ask, um, and you already mentioned it, that to have some of the uh, youth groups and who've been working on this issue. So thank you for that. Um, can I ask Jen a question about a slightly different topic? <laughs> if if we're so, uh, as soon as we get to closure on this one, absolutely. Okay. Well, we'll go All right. For that. I just want to reserve my my question for her. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you got it. Um, questions for Jen? Comments? I, we're not really ready for full discussion until we have the data in front of us. Uh, remember, our goal here is to look at the health implications of uh, what we learn about flavors. There's a lot to learn, so we'll go with that. Okay. No other questions, comments? Senator Hardy, you have a question for Jen. Yeah, Jen or Nolan, um, I see Nolan's on the screen too. Um, I'm wondering if either of you have the link to the audio only report that, that, that keeps, yeah, I, I, the reason I'm asking, I read it at one point, but I cannot find the link. I just asked Nellie and Nellie wasn't able to find the link either. Yes. Um, so if you could I will send that, that to maybe you, yeah. to the whole committee, I just like to review it again before we talk about that issue again. Sure. And it should also be available if you go back into the documents and look under, I think my name, um, yeah. Katie and I had presented that list of all the reports that are due to the committee. It's there should there. be a link right on that as well. Oh, I'm happy yeah, to also couldn't send find you. it, but, um, but thank you. Yeah. But if you have it available, that would just be That's easier. Fine. There's so many links. It's there. I was just reading it the other day, so you'll find it. I'm sure it's fascinating reading. <laughs> it is. It is very good. And uh, just uh, as an update, now that uh, let's, that's a good segue, actually. Thank you. Um, in conversations with the chair of House Health Care, and, and Jen, you can maybe bring us up to more current date. Um, the, the, the committee will be completing its work on audio only perhaps as early as this afternoon, then the, rather than have it be a separate bill from the house to us, the decision is to integrate it into our flexibility bill, which means uh, I think we're going to have to rely 
a great deal on the decision making that the House has made on this. Their goal is to have all of the interested parties come to an agreement. And if they do, and that's the case, um, uh, you know, we, we may want to think twice before we decide we want to change their decisions. So just a, just a foreshadowing of how we will look at the language. So please do read through that report. And then um, I've been just keeping touch with the work that they've been doing over in the house. Jen, do you have any other indication of timing on this or? I mean, I'm going back in with a new draft this afternoon after the floor. Um, and so there are, you know, there are a number of new pieces for the committee to look at, but a lot of that has been uh, working with one of the committee, uh, me working with one of the committee members to um, incorporate some suggestions from various stakeholders. So okay. we will, we will yeah, this see. Is and I think there may be a, a need to put in a, uh, a little something that, and it might actually be a nice tie-in with what you currently have in your bill um, to narrow the DFR rulemaking piece so that they still have some authority to, uh, to adopt emergency rules around telephone triage services, which is really outside of the scope of the audio only piece that's looking more at delivery of healthcare services. Okay, this will be, this will be good to, to look at. Thank you. All right, um, Senator Terenzini. I was just going to mention, uh, if you haven't seen VT Digger today, there was quite an article yeah, on VT Digger about audio only and the oh. pros and cons. So, Right. We, it was all the, the house conversation. I thought the value of that uh, article actually was its focus on patients and patient access. Uh, so the, the woman from Lincoln with uh, chronic illness who absolutely needed audio only. So there are some compelling reasons uh, to use it. So it, it was a good article, I agree. But it's not our, you know, it obviously it doesn't, I don't know that it completely reflects everything that the um, committee in the house has heard, but it is good. Anything else? Oh. Gosh, you know, I I totally mis misread how much time we'd be spending on S forty eight. Really, um, so that's okay. Anything else? And then I have a suggestion. Go ahead, Senator Hardy. I just I'm I sorry I missed the the meeting yesterday about the agenda setting. So I'm just wondering when we're going to get back to. Uh, child care, or if there's been some decision about House versus Senate taking the lead on that. Oh well, yeah, you 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 missed that. <laughs> so the this the the House is taking the lead on that bill. So okay. and I'm happy to talk with you um, offline about how it's going to go. Okay, that would be yeah, helpful. Thank you. And and we'll uh, we'll pick up a discussion about that in committee at some point. Okay. Yeah. Good. Josh, is your hand up again? It is. It's been okay. up a lot today. That's uh, good. Just a, just a procedural question. Uh, when a senator introduces a bill um, and it's, and it's uh, read on the Senate floor for the first time, who decides which committee it's assigned to? So it, it's, it's really the, the secretary of the Senate, but it's in collaboration with the lieutenant governor. And I, I think there are times when the uh, pro tem may weigh in. If there's a bill that you introduce and you, you're passionate about it and you think it might go to one committee or your committee, uh, sometimes you can speak with a chair and, and have it be directed to the committee of your choice. So there are conditions under which a bill absolutely goes to a specific committee um, and you know, obviously the jurisdiction of the committee is important. If it's a revenue, has anything to do with revenue, it goes to finance. Anything to do with an appropriation, it's going to go to appropriations. So um, I just, I think this is just yeah. one of those little nuances that I'm 
behind on because we're not in the building. So I, I just, well, little mechanisms of how it happens. Yeah, no, it's not, you're not missing, you're not missing it. It's, it, and sometimes you wonder how come that went there instead of here. Uh, so there, there are gray areas in, in all of the decisions that are made. Thank you. You're welcome. Anything else, folks? Nope. Well, I think, um, you know, I, I know that we will be working extremely hard. Um, next week, we're going to be picking up uh, some other bills that we'll talk about tomorrow. Uh, and moving forward, I know it's, it's difficult right now because we're trying to get some work done that wasn't completed from the last session. But that doesn't mean we aren't keeping our eye on the issues that are emerging new issues. So we'll do that. All right. Anything else? Well, uh, one other, sorry. That's okay. Um, the, I, I know we are potentially going to do a CRF bill um, and wondered if uh, we will get a crack at that in terms of any of the um, health and welfare related issues that so might. that's why we took up the information yesterday that was our first uh, you know another look and we'll be keeping an eye on uh, what the guidance is around that and then what the uh, specific um, appropriation might be because the house does the budget first and so the house human services and house health care committees get first crack at looking at that uh, we will keep an eye on what's going on over there, but and we'll and then we'll pick up and we will give our input into the budget process, and the you know, by budget process I mean in this case some of the federal funding. So there will be there will be at least two bills, at least two. We don't know how many that we'll be providing input on. So yes. Okay. Very Thank well. you. And I, I'm trying, Jen Carby has taught me to correct my language or Nolan, I forget who, who said it first, but it's not CARES funding anymore. I don't think it's CRF funding anymore. It is federal funding. <laughs> right. right, CRF funding was really the coronavirus relief fund, which was a specific, uh, specific fund from the federal government. And I think CARES, the CARES Act was also a specific piece of legislation. So I think at this point, we're just talking about federal pandemic related funding or federal COVID funding, however you wanna right. describe it. So when we have the December bill and we have the unpassed bill, so the so we'll, we'll, we'll work on it all as much as we can. And, and, and Senator Cummings is on joint fiscal so she'll keep us uh, updated as needed. All right, good questions. Anything else? Turn back on. You could update the committee on the meeting on the rental assistance. Yeah, uh, well, let's do that together. And Mr. Rotkin were involved in that yep. last night because yes. at noon we're meeting to do that. Oh, that's right. So we did meet about the $200 million grant that's coming to us. Um, it, it, is, it does involve uh, a grant request by the administration for the use of the $200 million. And the concern that some of us had expressed was this is a grant that's being accepted by the administration, yet the legislature has doesn't have um, the ability to spend time evaluating how best to use the money. So we met last night, a group of us to, uh, to talk about what can we do to ensure that our legislative interests are represented as the money is used. We came to, an, uh, we came to uh, a position that, that we would like to see the rental monies and Anne, you'll have to correct me how much we finally put out initially. I don't it's, remember. Okay. Well we put we put a big amount actually of, I have a suggested yeah. 
just came over. So, okay, good. But so the conditions that we we would like to see are some of the conditions that were in place last time for the rental piece, and that is as long as we're we're paying for um, paying rent for people that we would like to see at least the uh, the rent amount held held steady until uh, for some time so that the the rent doesn't go up over time. So those are conditions that were in place, I think, during the last, last one. period. Yeah, I've got the proposed motion here. Oh, good. Read it. That's Just great. As, as background, joint fiscal has to approve the acceptance of all grants. Our power is to approve or disapprove. And we have 10 days from the time the request comes to us to approve it to make a decision. We do not have the power to amend, so we can't alter it. We can say to the administration, we'd be willing to approve if you would do thus and so. And, but they have to agree. We, we have, a, it's an up or down kind of thing, which is very frustrating to us. The proposal, this is a $200,000, no, $2 million grant. $200 million. And it is <laughs> um, very strictly regulated where the CRF funds were kind of do what you think are best state. This one has income criteria. It has very specific dates that it has to go out by. It has to be out and committed by September. Um, a big part of this, I believe, is to get a uh, platform that people can apply very easily and that things can go out the door very quickly. Um, but there's it's very limited. We, we can't, it can only go for rent. It can only go for utility arrearages. We can't do mortgage or anything else payments. So the proposed distribution is 110 million to the agents AOA for the grant uh, state housing authority. So that's for rent. Um, Okay, this program will be uh, implemented via the MOA, that's yeah, MOA Mem Memorandum, Memorandum of Understanding MOU, between yeah. AOA, VA, SSA, and DCD. Uh, it is further, and that was the uh, bill that went out last year that can, kept rents from going up. Um, sh the uh, agency shall establish procedures that housing units assisted with this money. Uh, follow Vermont's life safety code requirements and procedures to ensure rent is not increased as a result. Um, 12 million seven to the pub public safety, public service department um, to implement a modified version of their exi existing utility assistance program, which is the one finance heard about. They have been getting the money out. It has to go to individuals to pay arrearages, they'll be doing that. 15 million to the Agency of Human Services to assist homeless individuals and those exiting homelessness. Um, Nine is, million to I DH. Gonna, I was just yeah. gonna say about the homeless piece that a lot of that is for the motel program, so yeah. And also services to get you out of the motel program. Yeah. Um, 9 million for other housing services, uh, which pending tre um, which pending treasury guidance, which we ho don't have, may include tenant and landlord counseling, mediation um, by Vermont Legal Aid. Uh, 53,300 to AOA, AOA to hold in reserve to allocate to programs in need of additional funds any expenditures from the 533 held in reserve at the agency of administration, AOA's agency of administration, 
and any reallocations between and among subsections shall be approved by joint fiscal. So we're approving basically get all the money out the door, but if they uh, decide they wanna put more into one and move it from the other, it will need the approval of the joint fiscal committee. And I think that last number that you mentioned, 53 is million. Uh, yes, it is, 53 oh, million. Yeah, so then, um, so we have placed some conditions that we hope the agency of administration will accept. And it's similar to what we did last time. The concern that I express, and I think others have is identifying the need that's out there in particular, is the amount for utilities sufficient to cover? It's uh, not. It's not. And then. No, we know that. Yeah. And then, you know, there were questions about the one of the issues that, uh, needs to be covered is how eligibility, income eligibility will be determined. And, uh, and so the agency administration is going to have to figure out a new software system for that, that costs money. So it, there's, there's a lot embedded in that little motion that Senator Cummings read. Senator Hardy, you had a question. Yeah, um, Senator Cummings, the, what you were reading was the the stipulations that joint fiscal committee put on the acceptance of this money. And now at this point, it's up to the administration to say, yes, we can. This is that. pretty close to what the administration asked for. Oh, it is. Okay. Yeah. They, um, and I'm assuming that if we're getting set to make an emotion that they are agreeable right. to this. Okay. One would hope. Do you have this? Did this get sent out to all of us? No, it doesn't. Um, I don't know. I just, it's a draft. It just came in from Steve Klein sometime after 11 this morning. Yeah. So what happens is it, this is a, this decision, first of all, when the grant comes in, uh, those, those committee chairs who are involved in any of the areas of the grant are asked okay. What do you think about it? So I responded to that. Then there are, if there are concerns expressed, then we might get together with joint fiscal folks as we did yesterday to talk about um, what those concerns are and can we put provisions acceptable to the administration into grant um, utilization use. And then, so, so now, what Senator Cummings is reading is something that the Joint Fiscal Committee will deliberate at, at noontime today. So it hasn't, it, it's not even, it's not anywhere right now, except in a few people's it's hands. The proposal, I think, for what we can get, I, I chaired Joint Fiscal, it's a revolving chair between the money chairs generally. I chaired it last year. I spent a lot of Saturdays talking to Suzanne <laughs> saying, well, you know, uh, this is what we need. What can you do? I mean, there, there was a, a lot of just negotiating, trying to come to yes, so that when we went into the official meeting, the administration would actually change you know, they would have to bring us a new proposal to vote up or down. Um, I don't know where this is, but it will come in. Uh, it has come in as a proposal from the administration. This is pretty close to what they asked. We're basically putting most of the money out the door. Um, we've holding on to 53 million. A lot of that is concern about um, the arrearages because utilities now include fuel. Um, but there's also concern that came up that we heard about in finance, which is basically because there's a moratorium, people didn't access the arrearage money. And so the utilities were starving. They weren't getting paid even though there was money available and they actually had to pull the moratorium for a month so people got disconnect notices 
um, with information about where to go to get money. Right. And they said, so, you know, what, what are you going to do? And they said they really felt now they had enough of a list and people were, inter- you know, knew the process and knew how to do that, that they would be yeah. able to get them to apply to get them to get the utilities some money because utilities will have to do rate increases if they run out. So, so it's it's fun. uh, It's fun. Yeah. Senator Hooker, you wanted to add something. Just questioning, you know, where, how will this money be distributed? Would it go directly to the individual? Does it go to the landlord? (laughs) Would it, can it go to the utilities rather than, you know, if they have all these arrearages, why don't we just make them whole? A lot of this, um, the last testimony we had, federal guidelines said that the utility money had to go to an individual. And Department of Public Service, though, has set up some system where it goes to an individual, but maybe it goes and it's made out to a utility. But I, they haven't said there's been any issue with folks buying groceries with the utility money. The rent goes to the landlord, is what but, I've been told. But doesn't it, it goes through the? I think it goes through the renter. It goes through the, the um, housing authority. Yeah, through the housing. Thank you. And they've got a whole software system, easy app, right. um, and it goes. But that one does go to the landlord. Well, um, the hard it, part is. Uh, doing the income eligibility determination, which is 80% of the average uh, um, wage in a region. So uh, regional wage. And I, I still haven't gotten an answer to the question about what region. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so that'll be another issue, but I'm sure the administration will have. And it question. does not go to people that own their own homes. Right. So if you own a double wide or a single wide, you're not going to get any help with this money. Right. So we may, if you own, you know, your family home, um, but, and there's a lot of Vermonters that do that, um, and you've been laid off, you're up a creek with this money. We're hoping that the next batch um, we'll have right. fewer strings. We also could use people that just bought homes and then got laid off. Uh, so there's no mortgage assistance here. Go so this, this is the money that's already coming. Not this is the de- yeah. Allotment. This is the December, December allotment. Money. allotment. Okay. This so- is a Republican <laughs> bill. It has lots of strings. Okay, thank you. That was a political comment, Senator. Yes, it was. <laughs> All right. I didn't say if that was bad or good, but it <laughs> no, you did not. And we the and first one, <laughs> everybody got something, whether or not they were still working at full salary. This one is much, much tighter, and there are decided groups left out, like very low income homeowners who are now low income because they've been laid off. I think of trailer park owners. Trailer park residents. Yes, and paying their lease for that land or whatever. That's right, because they don't, yeah, yeah, I don't know if the lease comes under that or not. I don't know. I think it is, that might be rent. You think it counts as rent? I I don't know. I thought of that yesterday. Yeah, okay. Well, so it sounds like you have a full meeting. Yes. And now you're primed. The pump is primed and we're, but thanks, you know, for bringing that up because it was, uh, it was an important meeting yesterday. And I felt like our committee weighed in uh, pretty significantly in the decision-making on that. Um, and Joint fiscal has since the beginning been trying to, as far as possible, not subvert the roles of standing committees. Yes, it's very when clear. When we weren't in session and there was all kinds of federal money coming in, 
that was difficult. Everybody, all the chairs, and then everyone got notice. Right. Um, when there was a proposal so that anyone that wanted to chime in could. We wanted to make sure everyone knew what was going on. Um, normally, we set, you know, we approved some grants to the Department of Health to hire somebody to help put out rabies feed, <laughs> you know. I mean, yeah. it's pretty minimal stuff. <laughs> Yeah, well, this, the, this is not minimal. and, and This is also, not minimal. Yeah, and it also involves a lot of detailed information that only committees of jurisdiction might have uh, pay attention to. So, But we have done yeah. a really good job of getting all of that money out the door. Yes. And yes. many it, other states have not. Yes. Um, yeah. We could have done it better probably or we definitely could have been more targeted but it would have been slower right um going forward we're going to try and be more targeted so right. okay well listen I got thanks. thank you for uh, that, that was, this was a this was a good conversation to have i think sometimes all of this this type of information remains hidden and uh, it's, it's not something that can easily be brought up in committee on a, on a regular basis. But as we go forward with looking at the federal funding that's coming to us, and I include in that the next uh, piece that hasn't, has not yet passed Congress, we're gonna need to be clued in and part of the decision-making. I think the intention is as we did last time, the bulk of the money actually went through the appropriations process yes. and the committees of jurisdiction yes. came in and said, this is where we want you to spend we the worked, money. We worked very hard on that, yeah. and, but now it's like another layer of responsibility. And we don't know what'll come in. Exactly. Or what and strings we... So we, have, we have the budget, we have the new funding and we have our work, our everyday committee work, you know, including some of our pandemic bills. So we're looking at some longer meetings, possibly. Anyway. Okay. All right. I'm glad you're no longer a grizzly bear. Yes, that's good. I do have my grizzly bear. Oh. <laughs> that's my calming influence. All right, that's good. So okay. now I think we can go um, off live and then we'll probably call it a day. Thank you all.